Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the BBC News at One. Firefighters who heard the Manchester Arena bomb go off were sent away from the scene, according to a review of the response to last year's suicide bombing. The Kerslake report says fire crews stuck to the rules for a suspected terrorist incident but were left out of the loop by poor communication, and that led to a two-hour delay. 22 people were killed and more than 100 injured at the end of an Ariana Grande concert in May. Our correspondent Judith Moritz reports. It was just chaos. There was people everywhere on the floor, plenty which weren't alive or barely alive. I just, yeah, I don't know, I just went around and tried to do the best I could. For those who were there, the memories are still fresh. Those like Rob Grew, who heard the sound of the blast and ran inside the building. An ordinary member of the public who gave first aid while some emergency services were kept outside. Apart from the three paramedics that were doing like a great job, that's as far as it went until we realised that no more support was coming from the medical teams or the ambulances. Do you think that more people could have been saved if that help had been there? Definitely in the first 15 minutes, definitely more could have been done. Police and paramedics rushed to the arena, but very few went inside the foyer where the bomb exploded. It was thought a gunman was inside and designated a hot zone. And fire crews were held back for two hours by their senior officers, who accept they let the city down. This firefighter, who doesn't want to be identified, was on duty but wasn't sent. Paramedics were asking us where we were. People were dying. Why weren't we there? And we just were helpless. Because obviously when you're in a uniform service, you do what you're told to do. And we weren't told to do anything. Although the city had planned and rehearsed for a terror attack, on the night that it happened, none of those involved had ever encountered such an experience for real. The report says there are many lessons to be learned, but also that Manchester has much to be proud of, and there were many heroes that night. We had a very, very limited kit for a huge number of patients to treat. Michael Daly is thought to be the first doctor to respond. He set up an area for casualties at the train station next door. They just started to be brought down in larger and larger numbers. Um, they were being brought down on not just stretches, but barriers. Um, billboards were being used to makeshift stretches by the arena staff to just get people out of the foyer and down to the concourse. The National Emergency Helpline for such situations failed completely. A restricted local number was only set up four hours later. Martin Hett was at the concert and his family realised he was missing. It took hours to find out that he'd died. I tried to also, like so many others, phone that number that was given initially on the television. And it, probably 26 times I phoned until I got through. Um, and Martin's friends frantically went from hospital to hospital trying to find him. The public donated millions of pounds to a charity appeal for those affected. But the report also asks the government to look at financial support for victims of terror and makes national recommendations that go beyond Manchester. It is vital that we learn the lessons of what went less well. This matters for the people of Greater Manchester and beyond who were caught up in the terrible events of that night but also for other places that might experience an attack in the future. The report doesn't establish whether lives could have been saved if things were done differently. That will be considered when the inquests are held. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Manchester. And our correspondent Fiona Trott is also in Manchester, where news conferences are continuing. What more has been emerging, Fiona? The main discussion in the news conference that's happening at the University of Salford behind me is that response by the fire service, that two-hour delay. We heard from the firefighter in Judith's report, didn't we, saying effectively he did as he was told. What we're hearing in this news conference is there maybe is a difference in culture between the fire service who wait for instructions and individuals from the police and ambulance service who tend to go straight in. We've had reaction now from the mayor, Andy Burnham, too. He says the fire service fell well short 
short of the high standards it sets itself. He's called for an ongoing review within the fire service to become a whole service review into how it's run and operates with other emergency services. The other discussion that's taking place in that news conference is about the 0800 helpline number for families. It wasn't up and running. The report describes it a catastrophic failure. Now, the report has mentioned that because of an ongoing contract Vodafone have with the Home Office to provide this helpline number in ongoing situations, it really needs guarantees from the company that it will not happen again. Today in the news conference, he's gone further than that, says the company should now apologise to the victims. One last thought that we've heard from the Mayor Andy Burnham a few moments ago that's echoed in today's report. Everybody in the city played their part. Manchester was a beacon of hope. The terrorists will never win, he says. Fiona Trott, thank you. tolerate such impudence, as he called it, and will take action. Ireland and Australia have become the latest countries to join the global protest. Australia's Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter was a brazen attack on the sovereignty of all nations. Tom Burridge reports. President Putin's Russia has never faced such a coordinated diplomatic punishment like this. The list of countries which will expel Russian officials has grown longer. So far, more than 130 diplomats or spies will have to leave 24 countries. It's rare that words in diplomacy are backed up by so much action. The Foreign Secretary today buoyed by the response. Following the abhorrent chemical attack in Salisbury, I've had a number of discussions with counterparts across the EU, the US and elsewhere, which has helped foster an unprecedented, robust, international response to this reckless Russian act. Russia's alleged involvement in the nerve agent attack on a former Russian intelligence officer and his daughter in Salisbury three weeks ago, the catalyst for this unprecedented international response. But Australia's Prime Minister said it was just the latest aggressive move by the Russian state. It reflects a pattern of recklessness and aggression by the Russian government including the annexation of Crimea, the invasion of the eastern Ukraine, the downing of MH17, cyber attacks and efforts to manipulate Western nations' elections. The latest, this latest incident demanded a response. The United States is expelling 60 Russian officials and closing the Russian consulate in Seattle because it's near an American submarine base. But some say this is about more than just degrading Russia's capability to spy. Yes, it was partly house cleaning, but I do think it was to show this unprecedented solidarity with Great Britain. And I think in the US it's not unconnected to the uh, Russian election interference in 2016 and the fact that our government says that the Russians are continuing to interfere in the cyber and social uh, media sphere in the US as we face our own midterm elections. In Syria and elsewhere, Russia has become more assertive. While at home, the Kremlin has argued that Russia is the victim. So the expulsion of Russian officials will feed into that. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said his government would not tolerate impudence and would respond. For now, President Putin is, like much of Russia, focused on mourning those who died in a fire at a shopping mall in Siberia. But with NATO expected to announce further measures against Moscow, it is only a question of when Russia will respond. Tom Burridge, BBC News. Well, in a moment, we'll talk to Duncan Kennedy in Salisbury. But first, let's head to Moscow and our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. A question of when and, and what. What do you think might happen from here on in, Paul? Well, I think we are, Jane, inevitably in for another round of tit for tat. Uh, officials here have spoken of reciprocal moves. I think we can assume that scores of uh, European and other diplomats will be told to pack their bags probably in the coming days. The timing, well, as Tom said, uh, Russia is very much preoccupied with the uh, appalling outcome of this fire uh, in Siberia. And, of course, it's a rather more complicated set of uh, expulsions given the sheer number of countries involved. But I think uh, it could take a few days to play out. I think it's likely that we'll see the Americans being told to go first. As to whether any of this will have any effect, well, the only effect so far has been
to rally politicians around the Kremlin here. To uh, You hear lots of people talking about the West ganging up uh, on Russia. It's very much echoing Vladimir Putin's narrative that Russia is, is isolated and that somehow the West wants to keep Russia down. So I don't think it's likely that we're going to see any softening of uh, Russia's position. Do they want this to escalate into something more than a new Cold War, a phrase we're hearing a lot of here in, in Moscow today? Probably not. But it has to be said that there is at the same time absolutely no sign of any mechanism to defuse what at the moment is turning into one of the worst moments in Russia's relations with the West since the end of communism.